For our talk this evening, we are joined by Phil Jarvis, who is Head of Farming, and Dr Jenny Bussell, who is a soil scientist from the Game and Wildlife Conservation Trust Allerton Project over in Loddington in Leicestershire. We also this evening, we have a panel of some local farmers who have kindly agreed to join us, uh, one of whom is our Society Vice Chairman, Charlie Reynolds, along with David White, Roger Davis and Ben Chaplin. Um, and towards the end, they will be operating a panelist discussion with Phil and with Jenny. And you will also get the opportunity to pose any questions as well. So without any further ado, if I could hand you over to Jenny and Phil and enjoy the talk. Thank you. Well, I, I think the best thing to do here, Jenny, is for you to start uh, our conversation. Let's talk about the weather and in your particular subject which is soil so do you want to go ahead and share the screen Jenny and off we go. Thank you very much Phil so I'm going to share my talk that I've prepared for everyone um if I just oops okay there we go everybody so um thank you for the introduction I'm Jenny Bussell I'm the soil scientist at the Game and Wildlife Conservation Trust Allerton Projects and I'm going to talk to you today about soil and the weather and Actually, I'm going to be focusing mainly on wet weather because the last few years have really focused my mind on that matter, particularly working at the Allerton Project where we have some quite heavy clay soils. Now I'm gonna um, just take you through how wet weather affects the different functions of soils. So a healthy soil has lots of functions. It regulates water flow, regulates gas exchange, cycles nutrients, and can store carbon, um, which is becoming more relevant now. We're all talking about how to tackle climate change, maybe with using soil as a, um, a store for our carbon. And wet weather will affect all of these different functions. Now, the first thing to consider when you're considering soils is that not all soils are the same. Um, they can be very different, and that's due mainly to the physical composition of your soil. So soils are all made up of sand, silt and clay and the different proportions of these are called your soil texture. And which ones of these you have changes how a soil will behave. So sand particles, because they're very big, they pack together very loosely, there's big gaps between them and if you have a predominantly sandy soil it tends to be very free draining so you tend to get fast infiltration through that soil. If you have silt particles, they're a little bit smaller, they pack together slightly tighter, you get less draining. And if you have clay particles, they are the tiniest particles by far. And um, they can pack together very tightly and leave very little room for water movement. So if you have heavy clay, you tend to have a soil that has slightly less uh, infiltration. Um, so it's, it's good to bear in mind what kind of soil you have. The other reason the type of soil you have is important is because it affects soil aggregation. Now aggregation is when the sand, silt, clay and organic matter and other uh, mineral ions in the soil group together to form little stable aggregates. They're normally bound together by organic and chemical bonds, so they're very heavily influenced by the texture you have in your soil and also the pH and things like the organic matter and mineral ion content. Clay soils, so the, the amount of clay you have in your soil, tends to be the biggest influencer on soil aggregation because clay particles are negatively charged. So they tend to, um, they flock round positively charged ions in the soil and that bond between the negative and positively charged um, molecules is what makes the start of an aggregate. So there's some research that's shown just 5% clay really increases the ability of your soil to form these aggregates. The next step in aggregate formation is the soil biology. So soil microorganisms produce a waste product called mucilage, uh, which is a lovely word, but it's basically just long chain polysaccharides and they bind all of these um, aggregates together in a nice gunky mess and they help stabilise aggregates. So the more soil microbes, the more active um, your soil biology is, the more of this soil glue you have sticking your aggregates together and making your aggregates stable. 
And then the last step we have is the plant roots and the fungal hyphae. And they can help bind together even larger aggregates, but they also have another function that they form a network all the way through your soil profile, really stabilizing that whole soil structure like a, a mesh or a net holding it all together. So they can really help in creating a, safe, a stable soil. Now, a soil that's considered to have a really good structure needs to have a mixture of these aggregates that are stable, so they have enough um, gunky glue sticking them together and enough bonds holding them together. So they're stable when, they, when water comes and tries to wash them away. And also they have to be different sizes so that they pack together, not entirely neatly, leaving nice gaps between them. These gaps in the soil profile are called the soil pores and you need a mixture of large gaps called macro pores and small gaps called micro pores. The macro pores are really important for fast soil infiltration. So when you have adverse weather, so maybe a, a huge deluge of water, if you've got enough macro pores, they'll help drain away that excess water nice and quickly. But the micro pores are equally important and they do the opposite job. They actually hold the soil, the, the water in, in the soil profile, so that there's water available for the plants to take up after the initial um, flood of water has drained away. And lastly, an important thing to have in your soil is connectivity of these pores. So if you reach a point where um, the, the soil structure becomes compacted at depth, you might find there's no pores at that depth and that means the connectivity of the pores runs out the water's going to run down to that depth, maybe it's at 20 centimetres, and then it's going to stop. It's not going to be able to percolate any further down your soil. So having a compaction layer can really stop the connectivity of your pores all the way down to depth. And that will also obviously impact on your infiltration. And it's not just important for water movement through the soil. Connectivity is also important for oxygenating your soil, making sure that the air from the surface can come all the way down to the roots and the microbes that still need the oxygen lower down in the soil. Now it can be quite hard to picture what I mean by soil poor connectivity at depth, but I've got um, what I think is a really exciting picture that I created some years ago when I had access to an x-ray scanner in Nottingham University. Now, um, I'm gonna have to talk you through this so you understand why I think it's so exciting. What I've done in this picture is I've scanned a soil core from a depth of 30 centimetres and I've removed all the soil so all you can see is the air filled pore spaces. And what I saw when I removed all the soil was the air filled pore spaces in this clay soil were all the structures of old earthworm channels and old rooting channels. I should explain that I'm only looking at the macro pores, so the big pores here. There's probably lots of tiny pores in there, too small for us to see. But what we can see is that at depth, this soil, which has previously had a cover crop in it, has still got all those old rooting channels from the previous crops and from the earthworm activity. And you can imagine how that network of pores at depth is really helping with water and air movement through the soil. And I like this image because it's sometimes very hard to get your head around what a soil at 30 centimetres depth might be looking like. Um, without the x-ray scanning technology, I don't think it'd be very easy for us to imagine that that's the benefit that um, earthworms and roots are having to a soil. So with that said, I'm going to move on just to talk about earthworms for a little bit. They're often called the engineers of the soil because they do all that work producing these um, channels through the soil. They're also considered an indicator of soil health. <clears throat> That's because of all the other functions they do with the soil. So they can mix soil up and help with soil aggregation. Again, similar to the microorganisms, they can produce mucilage type of material that helps produce those nice stable aggregates. They also, um, have more, there's more microbes in the soil that comes out of a worm than in the soil that goes into a worm because the worm adds lots of microbes from its own gut flora into the soil. So it's enriching the microbial community in your soil. 
and they incorporate organic matter. So they break down organic matter, they pull it from the surface and bury it deeper in the soil, which is very important for things like um, carbon storage and also for cycling nutrients so that that organic matter can be broken down and available again for plants to take up. And lastly, as I talked about before, by producing those channels all the way to depth in the soil, they can really improve infiltration, which can make your soil um, more resilient to heavy deluges and, and adverse weather. And because of all those benefits that earthworms give, they can improve your crop yield. Um, there's some research that suggests that earthworms can improve yields by up to 25% because of all these benefits they have. Now there's three main types of earthworms and they all have, they all do slightly different um, jobs in your soil. And it's actually quite easy to have a look at an earthworm and guess what type of earthworm it might be. So if you go in your field with a spade and have a dig, you might be able to see what kind of earthworms you have in your soil and what they might be doing. The first ones are the epigeic worms or the surface dwellers. They're very pigmented, quite small and they just live on the surface in the litter layer, breaking that litter up, making it um, available for other things to digest down further. Then we have the endogeic worms, and these ones are very obviously pale. Because they never come up to the surface, they don't need that protection from the sun like the epigeic worms. They're these nice pale worms. They live in the top 20 centimetres of your soil and they move burrowing horizontally. So they are really important for increasing pore space in that top 20 centimetres of your soil, as well as again, incorporating and breaking down organic matter. And then the last ones are the anaesthetic worms. And you'll know these ones because these are the really long wriggly worms you sometimes see coming up in wet weather. They can grow up to 30 centimetres long and they produce these very deep burrows all the way from the surface down to 60 centimetres. And these ones, these burrows are the most important for fast infiltration because you, you can imagine a lot of these burrows going all the way down to 60 centimetres um, are going to help water flow. And also these burrows remain stable long after the um, anaesthetic worms have died or moved on. These burrows are often still found in your soil improving infiltration. So to have a, a good soil um, structure, you need to have stable aggregates which won't break down when, when the rain falls on them and pore space, big and small pore spaces and connected channels made by roots or earthworms. And the ways to improve these would be to have a healthy microbial community which helps form the aggregates um, a healthy earthworm community to help with those earthworm channels and maybe quite a lot of ground cover to help produce those roots um, that when they die off, they, they maintain those channels in the soil. I'm just gonna go through what we've been doing at the Allerton project in order to work out what kind of soil management might improve um, a soil's resilience to adverse weather. So it might improve soil aggregation or stability and soil structure. The first thing we've been doing is looking at this picture here on my left. This is called micro rest and it's the way we've been measuring soil microbial activity. Now the idea is that you put a small amount of soil in each of these tiny wells down here and then you feed the soil lots of different types of substrates that you might find in the soil so organic acids and sugars that the soil would normally break down if it was out in your field. Then as the soil breaks down those substrates, the CO2 released goes into these little pink gel pockets at the top, which slowly change color as more CO2 is absorbed into them. I can then read that color change and tell how active the soil is depending on what substrate it's breaking down. The more active the microbes are and the more the, the larger the variety of substrates that the microbes can break down tells us how functionally diverse that population of microbes is and how active it is. And what we found at the Allerton project was that we had um, far more active soil in 
plots that, where we direct drilled compared to plots where we just ploughed. So when we disturb the soil, it seemed to have an adverse effect on that microbial community. The other thing we look at at the Allerton project in a number of our fields is earthworm population. So we just dig a nice big spur hole, sort through it and count all the worms we can see. And again, we found when you um, direct drill, so when you minimise the amount of disturbance you do to a soil, then you can get an increase in the overall earthworm numbers compared to um, when we ploughed. So um, increasing the microbial community and increasing the earthworm population would be two ways which you could help your soil uh, gain some more resilience against the adverse effects of um, floods and deluges and very wet weather. We also at the Allerton Project have been considering what happens uh, in a poorly structured soil with wet weather. So the obvious ones are things like soil erosion, if the aggregates break down and, and disappear off in the water. You also can get anaerobic conditions. So when water is sitting on soil or when soil is so saturated with water that all its pore spaces is filled with water, um, things like earthworms and microbes can still survive in those conditions because there is some oxygen in the water. But oxygen diffuses into water much slower than through air. So slowly that water becomes anaerobic, which means there's no oxygen left in it. Microbes can still respire with no oxygen in the water, but they'll do so anaerobically. And that's been seen to be between 60 and 95 percent less efficient. So they're mineralizing of the nutrients and cycling and turning nutrients into plant available nutrients can become 60 to 95 percent less efficient, which is obviously very bad for your crop. Lastly, the thing we've been most interested in researching at the Allerton Project is the effect of poorly structured soils in wet weather on greenhouse gas emissions. And we have um, a nice instrument at the Allerton Project that can measure CO2 emissions from your soil, which is obviously very topical right now as people are, are interested in how to farm in a way that can increase the soil carbon in their soil and reduce greenhouse gas emissions. And ploughing is often, or cultivation in general, has often been touted as, as bad for greenhouse gases because it increases the amount of CO2 produced in a soil. So some people are moving towards direct drilling in order to reduce the amount of greenhouse gas emissions. However, we've also been measuring another greenhouse gas called nitrous oxide. That greenhouse gas is produced in much smaller amounts, but it's found to be about 300 times more efficient as a global warming gas than CO2. So those small amounts could add up to being very important in terms of climate change. And the reason we're so interested in nitrous oxide is because, um, I'm going to show you very quickly the nitrogen cycle. You don't need to look at all of it, but it's this bit here with the denitrifying bacteria. So the denitrifying bacteria takes the plant available nitrogen and it, instead of it being assimilated into a plant, it turns it back into nitrogen gas in the air and also as a byproduct, it releases some nitrous oxide. And the interesting thing about these denitrifying bacteria is they prefer anoxic conditions. So they like wet conditions where the oxygen is completely depleted and that's when they're most active. So you can imagine we're thinking what happens if you have a poorly structured soil in wet weather that you direct drill straight into? You may gain some, um, some greenhouse gas savings in terms of CO2, but are you going to be doing it at a cost? Are you going to be releasing far more nitrous oxide? So we conducted a little experiment. Um, Phil was not very happy about this experiment because we got someone to drive a tractor back and forth, back and forth over his field until it was very compacted and not in a good shape at all. And then we put some plots in and we asked Phil to direct drill into some of these plots and into other of these plots. He was allowed to plough it to alleviate some of that compaction that he put in. And what we saw, if you look at the graph on the left, the CO2 did increase slightly in the ploughed conditions um, as the plough oxidises and, and stimulates the microbial community to respire. And 
you can see that CO2 is released a little bit more in the summer when the soils are warm and more active. But it's the nitrous oxide that we are most interested in because if you look in the summer, there's really no difference between the direct drill and the plough crop. But in the winter, when you have that wet soil and you have that added problem of compacted fields, so none of that water can move away down the soil profile, you end up with anoxic conditions, which is perfect for the release of nitrous oxide, this greenhouse gas. When we stack those two together, you can see that the increase in nitrous oxide on top of the CO2 means there's really no difference between the direct drill and the plough in terms of greenhouse gas emissions in the winter. And if you'd only been looking at CO2, you might have said that the ploughing was still um, offering you a saving in terms of greenhouse gas emissions. So it's really important to consider both these gases at the same time. Now, for the sake of fairness, um, we also did these experiments in a field where we hadn't driven up and down with the tractor and caused this worst case scenario. And when you did non-compacted soil, if you look at the nitrous oxide here in the winter and the nitrous oxide here in the summer, there's really no difference between the two plots, between the direct drill and cloud. And you can see with the CO2, there is, um, a slight saving from the direct drill to the plough, particularly in the winter here. So um, what we're saying is that direct drilling may not always be the environmentalist's dream that it's said to be. You have to consider the, the state of your soil. You have to consider adverse weather and what that does to your soil. So I think I'm just about coming to the end of my whistle stop tour of soils in wet weather. Um, so I'd just like to summarise what I've been trying to say over the last few minutes, and that's that a good soil structure has to be made up of stable aggregates that won't break down in water. Um, it's got to have large and small pore spaces so that the water can move through it, but there's still enough small pore spaces there to hold that water there and make it available to the crop. You can increase infiltration by looking after your earthworms by increasing your root channels through your soil and that will reduce surface runoff and therefore soil erosion. And that if you have a poorly structured soil and you have these adverse weather conditions, then you can get anaerobic conditions and they will reduce nutrient cycling, they'll re reduce the um, activity of your soil biology and they will also probably increase certain harmful greenhouse gas emissions. So um, looking after your soil, helping your soil resilience is a, a very good idea. But lastly, what we've seen and what we've tried to show in these experiments at the Allerton Project is that there's no one size fits all for soil. You have to consider your soil, um, your physical properties of your soil and how it would behave in these different conditions and also the uh, status of your soil. So if you have a compacted field, for example, we're not going to go out there and tell you that it's the best thing to do would be to direct drill it straight away. You have to consider what you know about your field and what you know about how soils behave. Okay, thank you very much, Bill. Okay, great. Thank you very much indeed, Jenny. That's, that's great. So, um, I've got a question here, uh, it's come from Tom Storr about saying, um, do you collect data on ecological groups or species of earthworms, or is it just a straight count of adults and juveniles? We do, we, we identify them all to species. Um, and we've done that, not just in that experiment, but across many experiments. And I'm sorry, I can't tell you <laughs> everything we found in terms of which species go up and which species go down. Obviously what you'd expect is that um, if you plough the field, you might find that some of the ones that live on the surface are damaged more than the ones that live deeper down because the plough probably doesn't reach those ones that are hiding at 60 centimetres depth. Um, and we've found that slightly, but, but we haven't actually been able to prove that in any of our experiments so far, I don't think. Okay, and um, would it be fair to say, I mean, there's over 20 odd species of earthworms in the United Kingdom. It may even be a bit more than that. Can 29. You put 29 species of earthworms. And, and would we see all of them on, uh, on all our farms? No, no, you wouldn't. Um, there's probably maybe 
10 or 12 species you're likely to find in your fields. Some species of earthworms are actually so rare in that they might be considered endangered, possibly just because we're not looking for them in the right place. There are species of earthworms called compost worms that you will only find in your compost heap because they need an organic matter content of over 60% to, to survive. And there's um, earthworms that live in, in woodlands called tree worms. So, so yeah, you will only get a certain set of those in your fields. And, and a final question before we move on to our next part is, um, which you're going to stay with us for, hopefully, fingers crossed. Um, this uh, soil glue you were talking about, it's yeah. something that I've seen a lot of on social media, and a lot of people uh, holding up plants with soil attached to it. But it seems to me this is a relatively new concept of, or understanding. Would you say it's getting more exposure at the moment? Well, see, I, I personally don't think it's new, but, but obviously it's becoming more... Um, it's becoming more widespread that people are starting to listen. I think people, I think soil science as a whole is becoming more talked about, which is a great thing. Um, and yeah, it's, I think if you have an understanding of things like the soil glue, how your plants are benefiting your soil aggregates, how your microbial community is benefiting your aggregates, you can start thinking through the problems you have on your farm. So maybe Field that's not draining properly and see what you can do with with those other techniques to improve it okay well it's certainly one of the questions i might ask the panelists later on about the soil uh, the glue in their soil so uh let's stay tuned and see what happens there okay well um, thank you very much indeed jenny as i said you're going to stay with us for a bit uh, we're going to move on to the next part of our discussion and i and it's uh we've we've let's talk about soil and let's talk about the weather well if you get a group of farmers or those interested in the countryside the weather's never far away from uh, our lips so i'm going to just hopefully uh, share my screen and i'm hoping that we will just see a few slides to uh, and and can you see them jenny uh, you're the only person i can see on the screen so this so the the slides are there well so let's talk about the weather and let's talk about it being the wettest the coldest the wettest again since 1766, the warmest and one of the warmest years globally. So there's a lot building up about how wet our weather is and it seems to be continually breaking records. And that's a, let's boil it down to what's happening now on our, on our farm. So this is some weather data from Noddington over the last 12 months. And you can see here, if I, if I show you the, the wet year last year, and then it sort of got better and that's when everyone rushed into their fields because they thought perhaps that's the lowest it's going to get and then of course we came through this period here started to rise up into august and actually if we carried on here we'd have seen actually the rain went down in september but up again in october to similar sorts of areas along here what's also interesting is about our temperatures we're not seeing a lot of temperature down at, here at Loddington getting much below freezing as a mini minimum temperature so that sets the rainfall in context with the temperature. And once again, maximum temperatures as well. I think actually probably we saw, uh, probably when this graph was taken, uh, if this was, uh, we saw one or two that were creeping up a bit higher than 30 degrees just after this graph was taken. So that puts some temperature and rainfall in perspective. This one I wanted to talk to you about wind as well, uh, because um, this is from our weather station at Noddington, and this is over a 12 month period. So this here is November 2019 at the far end at the zero point here and right at the other end here is is now today. And you can see just here is this foggy calm weather we've been having down here on the right hand side. But it's these peaks I want to talk about here. And one of them was probably around just around Christmas time. Another one probably in, in the um, in the sort of uh, springtime. But this is this is this one here is the one I want to talk about. And this is the one that caused me a lot of frustration with my harvest in the fact that this wind of 10 meters per, uh, per second is it's equivalent to 25. And some gusts were up as high as 40. And when your crop is just about vulnerable, you don't want your second equal or third highest windfall event to happen. So that just puts it into context you want to be down here during a harvest time. So that's, we talked about rain and temperature. There's a little bit of context about uh, wind. This is a picture of our landscape at Loddington. It was taken on Thursday. 
and you can see some trial plots up here and here and you can see some other uh, cover crops here there's a trial that's sadly one of jenny's trials uh cultivated but not sown and there's a field here which was meant to be in a winter wheat trial that's not sown. we're about 60 percent sown i suppose so some of our trials have been sown this is some of our cultivation trials some votes have gone in here but it's looking fairly steady but there are some crops coming through it is better than last year so the glass is definitely half full uh last year we didn't get any crops grown so this was taken last thursday as well with the sun behind and actually considering this headland was dr drilled when it was pretty wet you know i'm fairly happy the other thing that's good and the other thing that well it depends on your definition of good because there'll be some of you looking in that will say well when he shows me this next slide it won't be too good this is my crop of all seed rape um, and one of my colleagues dr alistair leek is always telling me that the first growth stage of direct drilling is embarrassment but i'm pretty happy that i've got a crop there in the fact that it's being protected a little bit by the stubble it seems to have got through the flea beetle and actually it's moved on a little bit more since then because this was taken about a week 10 days ago uh, we've got a trial in here with anglia water looking at herbicides and that's uh it looks like the combine was slightly higher cut the stubble there so we've got some rape so that's good news but we've got some crops growing this autumn so turning to a few slides now about what i'm going to talk to the panelists about and the first one is crops and rotation what's the wet weather doing to our crops what crops are we growing in the soil types we've got so that's number one the second one is what about cover crops and this is a companion crop actually of beans in some of our all seed rape and what about grass so here's a, a herbal lay trial that we've got grazed on on the hillside at Loddington. how do cover crops and how does grass fit into your system so the panelists will be uh, joining me in to talk about that and then what about cultivations in the context of your uh, soil type and texture so jenny's put it really into context about what texture means you know the clay the sand and the silt in our soil and basically how do we then look at what crop cultivations we do and how does structure play a part in the, the sort of things that we've been doing over the last few years on our farms then if we get time we might have a little discussion about what's the right drill well i'm pretty sure that there could be about 30 or 40 different opinions on what's the right drill we may get some consensus or we'll certainly have a bit of a discussion about it and then i'm going to just tease you with a few opportunities about what we can do later on but i'm going to perhaps bring that slide up if we get time at the, the end which is opportunities in this new area of elms and carbon net zero so uh, I think I'll stop sharing my screen then, and I'll ask James if we can put the panelists up on screen. And if, while we're getting that organised, and people are able to turn their cameras on from the panelists, Jay, we've got a we've got a bit of interaction for our audience, and I'm hoping this is going to work. Um, we've got a bit of an icebreaker for a, a poll for you to answer about now. It's about how much drilling you've done, but if you're not a farmer, but you know one, or you have farmers as your clients, or you've got an opinion about your next door neighbor and how he's got on, please do answer the poll. And the second bit, which is about your concerns going forward, if you've got an opinion, express it in the poll. So here we go, first one up on screen, and it says, how has your autumn sowing been so far? So obviously, fairly straightforward, we're, we're all drilled up. Just one answer on this, please or some hindrance to the weather but we're nearly complete it's been difficult we're over 50 percent we have some drilling but it's less than 50 i'm scratching my head and wondering where to go next because we've only got a small amount sown so there's i'll just give you a, a few minutes to get there you know if we can get a few people on there we i see we've got 22 people already voted so that's great a few more still pondering where they are a few probably you know maybe even think about your back garden How's your vegetable planting going for the autumn if you if that's the way the way you are but uh i'll give that a, a, a few more minutes we've got 28 29 people voted on there we're still going strong so 72 percent has voted according to my uh um screen here i don't know that you can see that can you jenny as well yeah i think we'll 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 see whether we can get one more in there at 30 and i'll presume then the other 10 are uh well uh right we've got there we'll just i'll give it i'll give it till uh one minute 30 and then we'll move on to the next poll i think 
Um, and then everybody, uh, I, I'm calling it once, calling it twice, the hammer's about to fall. And uh, 30 out of 40 have voted. Okay, James, I think we can end that poll there if you would. That would be great. I don't know if the results will come up. So there's a bit of a, a bit of a 23%, you know, so actually 60% pretty well nearly there. Uh, there's 23%, uh, there's one or two in the bottom there. I, I, I didn't vote on that poll because uh, I'm probably just in that middle one, about 23, uh, just about 50% complete. Okay, James, second and final poll. Let's see where we go with this one. So you can pick three options here. What are your main farming concerns? So pests and diseases, weeds, soil structure and conditions, soil organic matter, environmental land management stewardship, wet and dry weather, uh, sorry, wet and dry weather issues for livestock. And there's a few down there for the, uh, for the policy makers in there. And I see there's a few gone in there as well. Trade and standards and, and economics of the crops in our current location. Have we got enough? So we might need a little bit more time to vote on those, but you can put three in uh, and have a go at that. Excellent, seems like we're getting a few people So I think we'll 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 go to thirty people again and see if we get to thirty. Then we'll um, there's a few more choices to make in this one. Twenty five people have started anyway, so that's good news. Sixty two percent of our audience. Yeah, it looks like uh, environmental schemes is uh, neck and neck with soil structure and condition, and and, and pest and diseases is, is ahead by a nose. So. Um, and oh, I'm just down the bottom there. I didn't miss those two. So yeah, the economics of our crops. So I would imagine people are thinking along the lines of all seed rape and possibly getting some of our cereals in as well. So we've got 29. I'll probably once again, I'll, I'll, I'll let it try and get to 30, which it's just about done. I'll give another five or 10 seconds. And then, uh, so please, if you're still waiting and pondering, uh, can we get that mouse clicking away? Okay more seconds apologies if I do cut you off halfway through this and we're, but we seem to be slowing down there 31 of 31 participants voted okay I'll call in there calling once calling twice calling three times we'll okay James let's have a look and see how that that looks there where our results went so pests and diseases uh on 55 percent in the end uh, equal with uh, economic crops in our current rotation. So some real concerns there. Uh, and stewardship, what the future holds with stewardship schemes as well, coming in in sort of uh, second place along well, with soil structure as well. So some a good little bit of feedback there about uh, what we'd, what, 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 you know, to just uh, get a bit of interaction from our audience. Thanks very much for joining that. We'll take that down now. And what I'll do is I'll introduce our panel. So uh, we've got Charlie Reynolds, as Alison said, is the Vice Chair of the uh, East England Agricultural Society. We've got David White and we've got Ben Chaplin and Roger Davis. And I think what I'll do is I'll get you to say a little bit about your farms as you, as I ask you. The, uh, in fact, we'll start with that. Charlie, do you want to just give us a little bit of an uh, introduction as, you know, in a, in a couple of sentences about your farm and its location? Uh, thanks, Phil. Um, we are uh, 850 acre um, Hanslope Grade 3 series clay farm in uh, between Kettering and Corby. Um, organic matters we're trying to raise. Uh, we're moving more to cover cropping and direct drilling, um, but we're in a transition period of getting our soils into a condition whereby um, they can cope with it. Okay, that's great. David, welcome to tonight's panel. Would you like to say a few words about your farm and its location? Hi, oh, yes, hello. Um, so, uh, 400 acres, I farm between Cambridge and Newmarket, so um, East Anglian, light land, uh, fine sandy loam, running onto some chalk. I've been direct drilling, no till at all, for five years now, 100% um, cover or catch crops. Okay, thank you very much indeed, David. Ben? Over to you. Would you like to say a few words about your farm and location? 
Yeah, good evening. Uh, we're in Ketching as well, bordering Charlie, Charlie Reynolds. We're, um, we've got 580 hectares in a contract farming agreement, uh, predominantly clay. Uh, we're also running 1,500 ewes and some store cattle. Our main focus going forwards in the rotation is to gonna include a lot more uh, forage and fertility lays uh, and mainly incorporate a lot more livestock into the arable because predominantly it's been very standalone as two separate enterprises. Okay, great. And Roger, last but not least, you'll see a lot of farms. Uh, could you give us an idea of, 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 of your sort of soil types that you visit and the farm types that you visit as well? You're on mute, Roger, as well. It, it's a... That helps, doesn't it? <laughs> That helps. Uh, thank you, Phil. Um, yeah, so Roger Davis, um, I'm a director of uh, Indigro, and there's eight uh, agronomists in our consultancy division. And um, we come from sort of North Lincolnshire down to Bristol and across to London and back up. So a fair old chunk of the country with various soil types um, and various cropping. Um, and I suppose really I'm getting more and more involved in regen farming, soils, um, and carbon and uh, very interesting to listen to Jenny this evening because you know those are the sort of things that we're encompassing on farm and uh, you know looking towards the future just looking at how we can not only um, maximize cropping but also sort of clean up water and do some good stuff for the environment as well. Okay excellent Roger. David I'm going to come to you first because I heard the word sand and chalk and loam and I heard Charlie talk about hand slope grade three which is very similar to us. Can you give us an idea on our first subject, which is really about crops and rotation and what the sort of crops you're growing and the sort of rotation you follow? OK, so I used to be a sugar beet farmer, but um, having embarked on no-till, um, I thought some sugar beet in the rotation might just undo everything that I was trying to do at the other points in the rotation. So now 100% combinable, um, all seed rape, uh, which I might or might not have this year. Um, spring beans, spring barley, spring oats, um, and winter wheat, obviously. So all combinable. There's no fixed rotation, really. Um, we discovered that we could grow rate reasonably successfully with companion crops, certainly for the four, first four years of what I was doing. Um, and so I sort of used up the rate slot in my rotation quite quickly. And have now gone on to some second wheats actually and wheat following spring oats. So we're now looking at cereals after cereals, whereas for the first few years in the no-till rotation, it was always cereals after a break. So things have changed slightly. And, and would you say, if I just quickly ask a supplementary about the weather, the fact that probably black grass, not, not too much of an issue with you and being able to get on the, uh, with a, the freer draining soil? Yeah, um, black grass, not too much of an issue. We've got some, but um, we manage it with rotation and minimum disturbance. Um, Jenny mentioned earlier that sandy soil is free draining, but of course, sandy soil, uh, if you cultivate it, can slump quite badly and isn't self-structuring through the dry period of the summer like um, clays are and chalk never seems to need to self-structure. So sandy soil, whilst being free draining, has its issues. And certainly uh, looking around this autumn and last autumn, people that have been ploughing or tilling, even non-inversion, but quite heavy tillage with the rainfall that we've had. And we've had it over 150 mil here since um, the end of September, September when it started, um, does cause that sandy soil to slump and run together. And it needs quite a lot of work or a, quite a light touch sometimes to, to get on at all, to, to bring some life back into it if you um, haven't got anything growing in it. Okay, thank you very much indeed, David. So Ben, I'm going to come to you now and talk about cropping on your soil type. And you said in your introduction that you were beginning to bring more livestock into your system. So I'd imagine that you're probably pulling a bit more grass in now. Yeah, so we're looking at either two year grass and clover lays, um, which we, we've, we've trialed a small plot that that's been going quite well. Uh, we've got some herbal lays in as well. Um, they, they have made a, a real significant difference. Uh, they take a bit more managing from the, the, the livestock aspect uh, as opposed to the grass and clover and then also stubble turnips um, where we can sneak them in really. 
And and just a couple, I'll probably ask you this is, would your herbal lays and some of those grasses be under stewardship at all as well, or would they be a standalone? Uh, at the minute, we, we're in a, currently in, a, in one of the old HLS agreements. So the ones we've got at the minute aren't, but it wouldn't be dissimilar to the current GS4. Okay, that's great. Okay, I'll come back. And, and what about the weather on your soil type? How have you found that this autumn? Yeah, we're, we're, we're far from drilled up. Uh, it's kind of mirroring last autumn, if we're honest. Um, last autumn, we, we one particular block laid very wet. Um, that was oats. We had uh, quite a lot of volunteer oats on it. So in the end, we ended up wintering about a thousand lambs out there. So there, there was a silver lining, building organic matter and, and some good, good forage for fattening lambs. So... So anywhere that's not sprayed off might have a string fence around it soon. And, and Roger, before I come to, to yeah, and, and Roger, before I go to Charlie, who's going to going to tell me how I should farm my land, I think as well. Um, what have you seen across uh, uh, cropping on on? You can, have you seen a shift in anything? Obviously, I would imagine you've seen a reduction in oilseed rape across the areas. Yeah, I think generally uh, oilseed rape is probably down. Uh, between 60 and 75 percent uh, over the area that we advise on um, and uh, amazingly this year the remaining this, the 25 percent say average that were drilled the rate looks fantastic um, which we didn't really expect um, and there's very little uh, flea beetle and uh, yeah I think from my point of view the earlier the drill crop the better um, and we had people dropping seed into standing crops to direct drilling and but you know most methods seemed to work it was just the later drilled stuff that was probably um, up against it okay Char uh, so charlie coming to you um i know I, I, a little birdie told me you had a, a, a quite an interesting couple of days when you're in that drilling scenario with we had to have everybody on uh, uh, on, on, on working every hour to get your crops drilled. How did it work out in the end? Did you get it all done? You're on mute, by the way, as well. Sorry. Um, yeah, we got, uh, we had both sons out. Um, we were uh, drilling all night and half the next day. <clears throat> We've got about a day of drilling wheat left, so we're very close compared to last year where we didn't drill any winter wheat. Um, I think our rotation, um, just briefly, we, for the last uh, five or six years, we've been going a lot of spring barley to help us with our um, black grass uh, problem. Um, we've also grown some sugar beet, which uh, we haven't grown this year. It's just become too emotional on this, on this stronger land. Um, but we've moved away from spring cropping this year. I just think the last two years, talking about the weather, we've seen our soils go from too wet to be able to do anything to too dry in the space of about um, two weeks uh, and then the dry period that's followed in in April, May, June or April, May and certainly uh, has really challenged the spring crop so we're moving back into a, a more winter um, winter crop basis but if we do lose any all seed rate we will put in some spring oats to um, to pick up a continued break but we'll basically break first weeks. Okay, that's great. So I'm, I'm going to move on now to the subject of uh, cultivations. By, by all, um, I've just got a question in here uh, in the chat room saying, have the panellists undertaken a carbon audit? And if so, does it influence decisions made on the farm? Has anybody done a carbon audit on their farms? Um, if anyone, David, you looks like you're ready for action. Um, no, I haven't yet. We're, we're looking at it, obviously, um, because of the way we're farming, uh, we think we're farming in a, um, an environmentally friendly and um, fairly carbon neutral um, system. Uh, we're looking at it now, but we're looking at it with some of our supply chain partners um, that I would be dealing with through CamGrain to make sure that if we pick uh, a tool or an application to start measuring with it's something that's recognized rather than everybody doing something slightly different so uh, I think that you know it's work a lot of us will perhaps start to undertake this winter time following articles in the farmers weekly and, and you know the high profileness of um, of knowing what our carbon footprint is that's uh, prevalent at the moment. Okay uh, Roger and Charlie Roger I dare say you've probably got some clients or some farmers that are doing carbon audits? Yeah, we've, we've done a study where we've uh, surveyed 15 farmers 
um, with the Cool Farm tool. And that's been uh, quite quite an interesting venture, really, just to see exactly what uh, what the carbon emissions and um, and sequestration uh, levels are with the different um, direct drilling methods and conventional farming methods. Um, I think there's still quite a lot of work to do on the tools themselves, um, but we are uh, investigating that in greater depth. And um, yes, we've got some really interesting. Um, uh, findings, but we, we'd like to carry on and do that again next year and just compare this year with next year and hopefully one year we might even get whatever a normal year is um, so that we can compare some, some and, and Charlie, I'm, I'm going to come to you, then I'm going to talk to Je ask Jenny to, to make a comment on carbon and carbon audits as well, so uh, about, you know, wh where you think the carbon um, auditing process and how easy it is to get a, a, a carbon calculator that works for us all. Charlie, have you done carbon auditing on your farm? Um, we did some car carbon auditing uh, five, six years ago with Cam Grain and, and as AB Sustain. But I, I think just looking at um, where the tools are at the moment, as Roger says, there's a variety of tools about. I don't think there's anything which really takes in uh, the whole ecosystem of the farm. We can look at a field of wheat in, it, in its... Um, in, in itself, but we're not taking in hedges, we're not taking in grass margins and all the other elements which make up the full carbon cycle within the farm. So I think um, as, as David and, and Roger both said, there's some way to go, but we have got a, a reasonably good basis to start from. So Jenny, just turning to you and, and, and looking at how um, your, your com our conversation or your, your presentation on greenhouse gases and compacted soils and non-compacted soils, how difficult is it going to be for there to be a carbon calculator that gets the engagement of farmers at one level yet yeah, is, is, is good enough to actually have some tangible difference? I mean, I, know, I think you probably know the answer to that. You'll probably say, but... Yeah, it's, I mean, that's the million dollar question. It's, I, I don't think I could do it. <laughs> um, we, have, we have some problems measuring carbon. Um, that's... I guess where I'd start initially is that um, we've done some experiments. We've done some experiments with partners across Europe and we all measure carbon using different methods. And we found it very difficult to actually compare between our methods as scientists um, who have backgrounds in carbon research in order to be able to compare how we're measuring carbon with different methods. So in order to do it, across many different farms, all using different management practices. Um, and even within your fields, you know, the, the microclimate of your field is obviously gonna really impact what's happening at, at the um, um, tiny scale on your field in terms of carbon. Like you're talking about hedgerows. I mean, you're thinking hedgerows, ditches, that little compacted hammock in, in your field is all going to be doing different things. It's a mammoth task and, and they will have to um, they will have to strip it back to something simple or we're not going to be able to use it at all. But I think the main thing that I would say from this is, is we have to all, we have to have a decision on how you measure carbon and it has to be uniform across, across everything we do and done in a consistent way year after year so that we have a starting point we can all move f forward from, I think. So it, um, finding a way that we can find some uniformity in measuring carbon, but also I would imagine we should be encouraging in these new environmental land managers, the practices we know go towards improving soil health. You know, yeah. the things that we already know, there's lots of um, uh, things that we can do to our soil or into our rotation that will help us improve that. So great, Jenny, that's great. We'll, we'll come back to you a bit later on. I wanted to move now to cultivations. And Ben, if I might come to you and say that um, in your arable rotation, um, how what sort of cultivation system you might use and then how you might have put your grass in as well so do you want to have a go at you know your cultivation systems yeah so it, it currently is quite traditional um we're, we're only plowing when necessary so at, at the minute we're we're currently doing quite a lot of drainage work uh, and we are you know we're going to have to repair some of that land and i think the only way we're going to repair that is to plow it this uh, this autumn it's not uh it's not in the rotation you know regular plowing uh, the way we've established uh, most of the um, the grass lays, herbal lays, um, has been either with a John Deere 750A 
uh, or the um, or the Vardestad Rapid. Um, we we have had to do some work with the Rapid just to keep the trash down in front of it. Um, but but apart from that, the 750A has been been good. Um, or or we have even just blown it onto stubble as well, uh, and that that's that's worked quite well just with a set of grass arrows. So I, I think uh, hold those thoughts on the 750 and the rapid drill because we're going to come to drills in a minute. So uh, we'll we, we, with that. Roger, just going to turn to you and say, um, Ben mentioned something there about you obviously see a lot of different types of cultivations across your uh, farms that you deal with, but also you probably see a, quite a lot in different uh, states of drainage as well. So, you know, what about, can you try and give us some light on drainage and cultivations across the, the areas that you look at? Yeah, I mean, a, a lot of it is obviously soil dependent, but I think um, lots of farms have probably neglected drainage in the past. Um, and certainly we, when we've been growing wheat rape, wheat rape, I've found that a lot of our drains are actually blocked with uh, rape roots anyway. Um, and obviously we're moving away from that a little bit, but just to rectify that is a, a fairly good start. But, you know, um, I've got plenty of farmers that are actually marking out falls and, and doing some more um, mold drainage and um, actually doing visual soil assessments and digging to see what compaction levels that you've got so that you can rectify those with, with mold drains or subsoil or whatever you might be doing. Um, and obviously the, the cover crops uh, are helping us in, in a big way. Um, just by having sort of 24-7 green cover, but also, um, as Jenny said earlier, you know, the rooting is actually helping us um, with, with the uh, infrastructure of the soil. But also, I'm amazed at how much the worms do when we've started incorporating cover crops into the rotation. And just having uh, areas, I've got a field where the cover crop didn't take very well and we sprayed it off with glyphosate and, and now we've direct drilled straight into it. And the worm casts where the cover crop was and where it wasn't is immensely different. So the, the worms are actually doing the cultivation for us and um, it's incredible how many horsepower they can kick into a bit of soil. Um, okay. And they're, they're, they're really, really doing a great job. Okay, I'm gonna to come to it. I, I, Ian Gould's asking a question in the uh, question and answer. So I'll come to Ian's question in a minute. I'll just finish off with Charlie and then David. Charlie, drill types, uh, uh, sorry, uh, cultivation. What's your main cultivation system? You're on mute again, Charlie. It's, uh, it's the Zoom world. <laughs> um, similar to Ben, rotational plan, mainly for black grass, um, and then a light disc or a light tine, uh, and then drilling into that, trying to develop a stale seabed. Um, we're looking at a different drilling system moving forward for this year, um, which we'll talk about when we get to drills uh, in the near, in the, in the next few minutes. Okay, and David, um, you said that you're a direct driller or very little tillage. Um, I would imagine that you, you won't have many bits of cultivation equipment then, will you? No, no, I haven't actually. Um, I, I bought two pieces of cultivation equipment this year, though, strangely. I bought a light disc machine. Um, people refer to them as a joker machine uh, to with a cedar on it to establish cover crops um, and also actually to manage the three meters around the outside of each field because when you're not cultivating um, you, you have a couple of issues you can get brome and grasses that creep in and rather than just rely on glyphosate to deal with that um, I'm, I'm doing a three meter um, lightly cultivated strip around the outside just to manage those weeds and, and the other thing I bought was a subsoiler because after five years of non-disturbance it's amazing how far out into the field tree and hedge roots go and they steal the moisture and they steal the nutrition and saplings start to appear and um, so I, I reckon probably once every three years after I've been around with the hedge cutter I'll go around with the subsoiler to prune the roots because um, without ploughing or cultivating, that actually is starting to be a problem in the outside, perhaps six or eight metres of the field. Yeah, OK. Um, I'll turn to that question now from Ian. Um, and it says, are the worries about uh, nitrous oxide a bit of a red her herring if you're uh, doing a thorough job of moving towards no-till system, as other tools such as cover crops, herbal lays would used to avoid any anaerobic conditions remaining for any length of time. Jenny, I, I, this would seem a, a question for you really, I think. Yeah, so um, I hope 
we're not trying to say that nitrous oxide is increasing in all fields. That's why at the end I tried to show the non-compacted field and there was, there was barely any nitrous oxide being released at all. I think what we're trying to say with that research is that under the worst case scenario where we really, really compacted that field, you can get the nitrous oxide spike. Before we did that research, um, some researchers have been speculating as to whether this nitrous oxide spike might be coming in all direct drill fields and it might be a common problem that we're ignoring. So we conducted this research to kind of dismiss this red herring and say, yes, it can happen under these worst case scenarios, clay field, very compacted, direct drill straight into it, compared to on, on our, another area of our farms, they gain a clay field but that hadn't been compacted, direct drilled into it, and we didn't see a nitrous oxide problem. So it's, it's a case of knowing your farm and, and knowing whether you can direct drill or whether your field's not in the state yet to move on to that, if that's where you want to go. Yeah. Okay, um, just to give people on the a call, we're probably going to have a, probably another 10, 15 minutes of conversation just so you can get the evening planned out. Um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to move on to... Uh, the subject of drills now and um, and we might take this in with cover cropping as well because obviously um, the sort of drill and, and, and maybe drilling into grass and things like that and, and, and David I'm really going to come to you first as, as I, I know a little bit about your background and a little bit about your journey as well so would you like to just tell us about your drill and, and maybe tell us about the good points and possibly the bad points or, or the challenging issues you have? Okay, um, so I've got two drills and then various broadcasters, but uh, I started off with the John Deere 750, um, well-established uh, record of doing the job around the globe, a very efficient um, disc drill, um, and it did the job really well. But you very quickly um, learn that in certain situations with chopped straw, because we're not selling anything off the farm, um, in certain conditions the disc drill will head hairpin and getting clean seed to soil contact in some conditions is is difficult so I bought myself a second-hand elderly horse tine drill and modified it with some suitable um, tips coulter tips and various other bits and pieces including some small seed hoppers and um, for second cereals now in the autumn in particular I'll use the tine drill I'll use the tine drill putting oilseed rape in following a cereal crop because you get that nice clean sweep of the soil um, with the tine. And um, so that has its uses at different points in the rotation. And then the John Deere drill will do my winter cereals after a break crop where you have uh, lots of hopefully uh, cover crop vegetation to cut through but no chopped straw. And the John Deere is very good in the spring as well once the worms have done their hard work over winter and uh, the straw is either decayed or been taken under underground. The John Deere works really well in the um, spring for spring cropping and having that minimum disturbance that that drill does means that it, it's very good for helping you manage your black grass and other weed problems. So with a well-timed glyphosate and then a very low disturbance drill like the John Deere is, is minimum herbicide after that um, in any crop really winter or spring um, so yeah both have their uses and because I haven't got plows and presses and rexuses and all these other things actually it's not a luxury to have two drills uh, and and to buy a second hand something like a second hand horse and modify it to do the job is really cost effective. Okay Jenny I'm hoping you're looking in the chat room there for a question that's coming to you so you can be preparing your answer. David there is one further thing on um, of people talking about um, going drilling into cover crops and with it being so wet the cover crop has actually carried their drill because um, there isn't a lot of soil for the tractor but so have you had any experience of that this this autumn where you've been able to go in perhaps if you'd had a more cultivated seed bed you might not have been oh certainly yeah and, and last year was the same um, we're in east anglia actually we're wetter this year than last year i know other parts of the country it's the other way around but uh, certainly if you've got if you've got green vegetation to run on 
you can almost choose your day. It doesn't need to be raining overhead, but the, 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 the soil percolates water away so quickly when you haven't moved it and when you've got root structure and wormholes. And with the green vegetation on top, it's, it, 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 there's very little issue actually with, with traveling and um, blocking drills and mud and pick up. So uh, yeah, it's, it's to, get a, to get a cover crop established right behind the combine is the, uh, is the important thing. You have to, you know, the day after the combine leaves the field, you need to get some seed in um, so that you get um, a good cover. And then it's very weatherproof system. And then you, you get to utilize all that solar energy, you know, with 25 to 30 degrees of heat uh, for, for 10, even for 10 days, if you don't get those crops in, there's a massive amount of solar energy, isn't it? Ben, I'm going to turn to you now. And, and um, we're already, we know you've got a John Deere 750, I think you said, and, and a Rappi. And the question I might ask you is um, when you're in these herbal lays, when you come out of them, might you be tempted to perhaps drill directly into them with your following uh, wheat crop, as it were? Uh, or, or are you, are you is the jury out yet? So, what are your thoughts on how you might use your drills in the future? Yeah, so I just might add that, uh, as I said earlier, we're in a contract farming agreement. We 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 run a virtually empty tractor shed, so we're quite fortunate that our contractor has a he's got John John Deere seven fifty A and a Porsche Avatar as well, with our with our neighbour running a um, with a Rapid. So we're quite quite fortunate, really. We can we can call you can on, pull in the drill, yeah, pull a few favor, favors in like that way, which is quite good. Um, myself and Roger, we was looking at a, a project Roger's been doing where he's been um, direct drilling into some into some clover lays. Um, we we went and had a look, and we was really impressed. So I think uh, we're definitely going to um, next autumn. We 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 definitely discussed uh, direct drilling um, a, a winter wheat straight into the clover lays. Um, so, yeah. so I can't, you know, I can't update you on that at the minute, but um, but it was yeah. certainly quite impressive what Roger was doing. Yeah, we 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 run a Dale drill, which is a thin time drill, and and, and uh, you know we've been very happy with it for five years. It just depends on on how wet it gets and and whether or not we can do a good enough job into grass with it. So we may well need to look at um, some flexibility with with a disc drill in, into grass. Roger, Ben mentioned uh, you must see a lot of drills in action over your territories that you look over which ones have performed well this year and 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 which ones have struggled a little bit without without being too harsh on some of our manufacturers uh, I'll, I'll, I'll name no name no names yeah name types uh, okay I, I think uh i think the the main thing is there's no one drill as david quite rightly said you know i think um you need to be flexible um and certainly i've 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 had several farmers that have got a time drill and a disc drill and the time drill uh, is quite often used for establishing new cover crops straight after the combine, as David quite rightly said, uh, harvest the, the sunlight, get that established. Obviously, choice of uh, the cover crop is uh, really important as to what you're trying to do with the soil. And also, people tend to forget, you know, are you, are you doing it for carbon, which is a great thing, and to increase your organic matter, or are you doing it to control your black grass, which initially some people that go into regen need to start to think about what cover crop they need to uh, fulfill their needs as far as black grass or whatever they're doing. But certainly I've established cover crops with um, with time drills. That's my my sort of, uh, my favorite drill, if you like, um, and move a bit of the soil, get get a reasonable seed bed, get a good established crop, of uh, cover crop. And then I'd look for a disc drill in the spring, as Dave was saying, where you don't disturb the ground, you don't move any more, uh, any, any more soil than you need to, um, reduce your black grass um, levels and, and also leave the roots where they are. And as soon as you spray off that cover crop sort of pre, well, I, I tend to spray them off pre-Christmas or just after Christmas, uh, let, the, let the worms do their, their work because, you know, obviously worms don't eat green, they don't eat green matter. So it's only when it's dead that the worms come up to the surface and start working. And that gives you time then to, uh, to, to get your seed bed prepared whilst the earthworms are working while you're asleep, basically. Excellent. So um, would you say that um, you'd be tempted to, um, I mean, I suppose it's, it's the right drill in the right situation, really. Would you say that's the case? Yeah, and, and a lot depends on what you're actually looking to do. You know, sometimes you might be trying to retain your moisture, in which case, you know, a disc drill is great. But like David said, if you've got lots of straw, then you can get hair pinning. Um, 
it, it gets much easier as you get sort of seven or eight years down the line, which David would probably agree with, when, when your soils are in really good heart and you haven't really done too much inversion, then, you know, your organic matter, your worms, everything's working for you. Um, and you can pretty much, I've got a farm that I've done that for seven or eight years and we're just onto a disc drill now. Um, and we disc drill our cover crops and disc drill our autumn crops and our spring crops. So, you know, that's what we do now. Hey, Charlie, just from, you wanted to just come back? Yeah, I was, sorry, yeah, yes, Phil, thank you. No, I was just gonna make the point that actually drilling speed, we're talking about drills, but drilling speed is very important. And it's not until I was lucky enough to visit some French farmers and, and see what they were doing that um, I realized that. And we, as traditional farmers, all get used to banging a Vadastad along at 16 and 20K if you can. But actually for direct drilling, in, we're trying to do minimal disturbance. It's, it's very much about going wide and slow and, and eight, eight or 10K really should be looked at as a maximum. And I know we've got short days and it's, it's been raining and we, we're all under pressure to get a lot in, but um, you know, the, the, the difference the drill makes by going slowly and giving it time and not boiling the soil is, is a big factor in black grass control and um, establishment. Yeah, no, I'd agree. I mean, our, our, our Dale drill certainly has, uh, the, you know, 8K, 9K is really good in it. It deals with trash fantastically uh, going through it because it's length of it. Charlie, uh, we got your cultivation equipment. We didn't get to your drills. Do you want to fire away on your drill? Um, <clears throat> yeah, we're currently using a mounted time drill. Um, again, drilling speed is, is quite key, but we have been looking at two or three different types of um, more direct type disc drills this autumn and evaluating which way we'll go uh, one of which I'm quite keen on uh, which is UK made and has quite a lot of tech coming with it on um, so we can seek out soil moisture and also it can do a bit of carbon measurement on it as well so I think that will be the way we go if we can afford to buy it. Excellent. Right. Um, Jenny, I'm going to turn to the question in the chat room for you, which is about soil health. And then I'm going to come back to our panel uh, for a few closing comments about uh, where they see the future going. And we'll perhaps not restrict ourselves necessarily just to the conversations we've been having here. But Jenny, the question in the chat room are, are, are around soil health and, and, and what might be the best test and then how we can link it perhaps to wheat in terms of yield. Yeah, so the, the question is about are there any other methods of testing soil health? And there are there are many methods of testing soil health because I think soil health is quite a loose term to define. Um, so it's very hard to decide how you actually test something that is, is hard to define. The test I was showing that was the micro rest test. Um, I chose that test because it tests soil functionality rather than just diversity. So there's a lot of um, DNA tests available commercially because when you send soil in the post, it, it obviously starts changing. It warms up, it dries out and the microbes die. So it's harder to test how they are functioning because as they, as they reach the testing lab and as they're stored for a week, they, they stop functioning in that way. So that's why us researchers often try and do this analysis on function, but it can't be sent for testing in that way. So there's DNA tests that try and replicate that, but obviously they can't tell the function. They can just tell you what's there, not whether they're active and not what they're doing. So that's, that's the problem in terms of sending it off for your own test. Um, Sorry, the question says, what's the best method for testing soil health and, and are you able to send your own samples for analysis? So the only test I know of that's commercially available that does a sort of functional check on the microbial community is a new one called the Sawville Carbon Burst Method, where they dry out the soil and, and then they pour water on it and that sudden activation of the soil, they measure the carbon that comes off the soil and that's the activity of the microbes. Would, would um, you be able? Would you be able to type that in the uh, the chat room for for? for so that I don't know if I know how to spell it. To be honest. <laughs> uh, okay. Well, we'll um, I'll give you a few minutes to look that up. Then I mean. Yeah, but, okay. but it's the carbon burst method. I will type that oh. in when it. Yeah, and then um, the second part of the question was: Is anyone doing research into how soil health relates to cash crops and yield wheat, wheat yield? 
And I'd say that at the Allerton Project, well, first of all, yes, many people are trying to do it. And I think it's an expanding area, which is really useful. And hopefully results will start flooding in soon and we'll get a really good idea on this. But at the Allerton Project in particular, we're part of something called the Soil Biology Soil Health Partnership, which is an ADAS funded project with many partners across the UK. And what we're trying to do is measure all the ways of measuring soil health that we can think of and, and linking it to yield and then turning this into a soil health scorecard, something that we're hoping farmers can use. So we'll distill down what the key important things are in terms of soil health that farmers can measure easily in their field and um, turn that into a scorecard with sort of red, green and amber lights in terms of different aspects of soil health so that you can go out and have a look at what your soil is telling you backed by our science where we've done all the measurements possible and linked back to what that might look at, look like in a field. And one of those measurements that I know has come out as key is things like earthworms. So um, sticking your spade in the ground, and just counting how many earthworms come up in a spadeful. Um, it's a really good indicator actually of, of many other uh, measurements we've done of soil health, such as um, free living uh, um, nematodes and soil organic carbon, and even the microbial community, they all feed back in interlink and could be measured just by a sort of count of earthworms. So that's one of the things we're working on. Um, hopefully, I think it's a growing area and, and I hope lots of all research and results are going to start percolating out to farmers soon. So, yeah. Well, well I, I know we, the, the, the farm that we work on has certainly been researched. Every clod has had its been analysed to the nth degree. And, and uh, I still find it really challenging on a, on a farm that has between 25% to 30% clay in it. Um, the weather often has the last word. Um, I'm going to just uh, tie up with the farmers now on some, some final thoughts. And Charlie, I'm going to come to you first. And it's basically, so this can be anything from what you think, what your concerns are, what you think about the future, whether it be novel crops, machinery costs we didn't talk about, uh, subsidies, environmental land management, even trade if you want to get into that. You know, I, I'll give you a couple of minutes to just, uh, you know, and it, or if you're perfectly happy with your lot, I'll move on to the next person. So Charlie, what do you think? What, where do you think we're going in the future? Um, in the future, not entirely sure where we're going. Um, obviously there's gonna be a lot of cash um, that's going to be taken to pay for this COVID, which we've just been going through, which might have come our way, but might, might not have done. I think we're going to need to use technology to work out which parts of the farm we're actually making a profit on from growing cereals or growing our cash crops on, and which parts of the farm will um, benefit more from uh, environmental land management type schemes. Uh, weather is a concern to me as we move forward and how the seasons are changing. Um, but I think that brings us probably back around to um, regenerative farming, um, as, as David and Roger have both alluded to, and how much easier it is to work the soils or to, to get onto the soil at any particular time of the year. Um, and I can see livestock becoming more part of the rotation as legislation restricts the amount of nitrogenous fertilisers that we can use. Okay, that's great. Thank you very much indeed, Charlie. Ben, yourself, um, what, what, what's sort of your, either your plans for the future or what, do you, what are your concerns, challenges? What do, you, what do you think the opportunities might be as well? Mm, well, well farming from similar to heavy ground to Charlie, I think uh, our main focus going forward is going to be building organic matter. Uh, we're quite fortunate that we, we've got a lot of livestock on the farm, but I think for other, you know, other farmers, you know, I, I would never be deterred from bringing livestock onto a farm. Some of these big arable farms, you know, there can be good benefits all round. And looking up joint ventures, uh, bringing in some expertise from somebody else. Um, I think certainly with a lot of stewardship options available, um, you know, it, you know, it, the funding's there to, uh, to be used. And if you, you know, if you can build your organic matter, improve soil structure, um, and somebody else can can come graze livestock on it. I think that could be a good good point to work together. Okay, excellent. And and Roger, what about what about where do you see the main opportunities and the sorts of directions that perhaps some of your growers are going in? I think um, I can just hear it raining outside now. So I think one of our one of our main things is uh, resilience and 
you know, the soils need to be resilient so that we can actually start to look at growing crops in a decent way and reducing our inputs, whether that be steel and fuel or whether that be just ag chem spend and all those other things. So I think resilience for me is, is a key. Look at drainage, look at soils, get the spade out, count the worms, um, look at compaction, mark your outfalls, do all those things but also start to think about what cover crops you're gonna grow and why you're growing them, whether that's initially to get rid of your black grass or to uh, improve your soils and put a bit of uh, organic matter back in the ground. Start livestock farming as far as worms and maybe get some stock from, like Ben said, you know, incorporate some gr grass into your rotation. But also I've had some such good results with sort of white clover understories where I've had white clover in my grass spray the grass off with glyphosate and I've left, I'm left with the clover. And uh, we're now just, as David said earlier, we're just driving over this green carpet with our, with a, a disc drill and we're just drilling when we like. The soil's the reason we drive because the soil's alive. Um, there's a, a little bit of complication in managing the weeds within the clover, but actually um, it, it's all doable and actually every time we knock the clover back whether that's be, with a bit of spray or whatever then we're releasing nitrogen which is feeding the crop so we've I've actually got some uh, clover understories that I've not put anything on bar the glyphosate so I've saved about 120 pound a hectare and um, you know they're looking really good and I'm going to lower my nitrogen as well so you know there's there's lots that we can do and it's I think there's a lot of excitement out there to to be able to do this and actually hopefully not that we should hang too many hats on it but we will be able to trade carbon in the future and if we can do something like an understory of clover and crop as well then that might tick a few boxes so lots lots of things to look at and, and maximize our our returns. Excellent thank you well just before I come to you David uh, I'm going to, I, I will just briefly show that one slide with opportunities at the end, and then Alison is going to wrap up. So David, do you want to just give us your final thoughts before I, I uh, we finish this panel session? Yeah, okay, thank you. Yeah, just following on from what Roger was saying, I think the carbon footprint will be important. Uh, yes, the system isn't perfect at the moment, but it, if, you, if you don't measure it, you can't manage it. And actually input management as part of that is going to be more and more important. And, and as Charlie said earlier, from work we did with him years ago, uh, we discovered that uh, nitrogen, as far as growing bread wheat, is 70% of the carbon footprint. And if we can get that down by growing cover crops with lots of legumes in and save 20 or 30 kgs, and that comes off our carbon footprint, that's going to be really important. Um, the other thing uh, with integrated pest management, I think we can, we've, we, we've got an understanding of how we can manage weeds and pests. Um, but we do need glyphosate for this system. And I know uh, the French farmers have got the ear of, of people um, that, that, that have a say over this and they're looking that, um, for glyphosate to be re-registered there next time for probably another five years. But it's, it is quite important that we, we put, you know, put the, a good story towards um, glyphosate and, and be able to use that. And finally, actually, a visit to you guys. And I haven't managed to organise a visit to come and see what you're doing, but you're doing some really interesting work. And when we get a little bit more back to normal, to get a farmer group up to see your farmer, what you guys are doing, I think would be really good. Well, thank you, David. And also, um, I think the other thing is that we might be doing a bit more of this because I think whilst we are a demonstration farm, it's great to hear what everybody else is doing as well and bring that information in. Um, I'm going to to share my screen in a minute but firstly can can i thank everybody on the panel for joining in there that that's been great and jenny thanks very much so we you know we've been through white clover livestock weather low input farming soil health greenhouse gases ipm nitrogen we even touched on glyphosate at the end there and we even got the solvita burst test in as well so thank you very much indeed guys james i'm hoping that i can just put that last slide up before which will be a, just a minute there and i'm hoping that you can see this slide now uh, is that on screen, the tractor? So I promised you about a one slide to finish off on. We talked about a lot of farming issues, but please be aware of the things that are out there. So Countryside Productivity Small Grant Scheme has just finished the late last round. There will be something else in. Uh, spelling the state there in the AT, AHDB top characteristics of best performing farms. Don't forget about woodland carbon guarantees and, and that process. 
Elms tier two, when it does come around, is talking about quite a lot of grants in there. So that might be an opportunity for us. Reverse auctions are not always my favorite, but we're entering into some. You can do them on crops, you can put some biodiversity, and on woodlands. Catchment sensitive farming often has grants if you're in an area for things like bio beds. The Woodland Trust can help you with planting trees. And look out for a couple of things which I think will be really important in the future. We've already talked about farmers joining up together. The Agriculture Bill is going to support producer groups. So if you're in a farm cluster that started for something around biodiversity, think about facilitation funding and direct marketing opportunities. If you've been in a cluster group uh, looking at your wider landscape, then you've got the fantastic provenance behind your, your uh, product your product that you'll be producing and you've got a group of like-minded farmers so uh, I'm going to stop sharing now and I'm going to hand back Alison to you uh, once again thank you very much over to you Alison